Moscow, 1988. These two heads of state, walking side by side on the Red Square, are the architects of a new world in the making. On one side, Michael Gorbachev, General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the great reformer. On the other, Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, the great conservative. Behind this peaceful image, smiles and promises of cooperation are just a pretense on this very day. Gorbachev actually knows that this meeting is the final act of a battle that his country has lost and that his neighbor, Reagan, has won out of cunning and brutality. He understood something that very few people understand. If you're in a fight with somebody, don't fight according to the other guy's rules. Fight according to your own rules. If you come at me with a five-inch knife, does that mean I can only defend myself with a five-inch knife? Of course not. What if I happen to have a gun? Ronald Reagan uh, was underestimated by nearly everyone. And Reagan saw that basically as a huge advantage. And, and persistently, by, by almost everyone, by, by the Democratic opposition here, when he runs against Ford by Ford, by the media, and then, you know, the, the Soviets, uh, at least they're far away. I mean, <laughs> you can understand why they underestimate him. By the end of 1988, Ronald Reagan leaves the White House. Three years later, in 1991, the USSR collapses. It's the end of the Cold War. History will remember Gorbachev. But who remembers Reagan? The key player behind the wings who pulled the strings of this story. If you took your camera now to Reagan's birthplace in Tampico, Illinois, it's the same now as it was in 1911. Uh, a little one-block town in the middle of the flat corn country. And if you moved your camera 360 degrees, you would see nothing but flatness, corn, 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 extending to the horizon. And the rest of the world is a million miles away. Now, Reagan was born in this centeredness. He grew up feeling isolated, unthreatened by the world outside, feeling an enormous sense of personal rightness and place. On this photo in the upper left, Jack Reagan, the father, a grocer. On the right, Nellie, the mother, housewife, a devoted Christian. Ronald is six years old, with his younger brother next to him. One of the things we discovered with Reagan was when he was a little fellow, about you know, five years, six years, seven years old, you know what he had for grades? Perfect. 100, 100, 100, 100. And I said, you know, when, when you were a little kid, did you go in and raise your hand and tell people how, you know, what, what everything was going? And they said, oh yeah, it was really, it was really fun. And I said, then what happened? Well, the problem is, then they didn't have a friend. People didn't like him. So those were little, these smart people. And they all worked in some way to bring it back down and forget about that part. They'll play ball, they'll do all kinds of things, and they play boxing. And, and uh, they will do something so that it, people don't realize how smart they are. Because if they do, uh, most of the time they don't like you. Feeling limited in Tempico, Ronald leaves for a college in Illinois, where he majors in sociology. To earn his life, he becomes a sports commentator, until the day when he really decides to go his own way. He's 25 years old when he lands in Hollywood, where his handsome face immediately seduces.
He chooses his roles strategically. In 60 films, he only plays positive heroes. Within a few years, he becomes a star. The habit was to go to the movies on Saturdays uh, in the afternoon at matinee. Uh, everyone knew of my generation, knew Ronald Reagan um, as um, a good fellow wearing a, a white cowboy hat. And the white hat cowboy is the good guy, and the black hat cowboy is the bad guy. Nineteen forty one. America enters the war. Discharged for bad eyesight, Reagan then goes to Hollywood, far from the battlefield, to fight with propaganda films where he finds he's a patriot. In 1945, Captain Reagan is asked to direct films based on U.S. Army footage brought back from Europe. He discovers these scenes filmed at the time of the liberation of extermination camps, scenes that few people know at the time. It is very important to understand Ronald Reagan's attitude toward the extermination of the Jews in World War II. So day after day after day that spring, he sat and watched this footage. That changed him. And I think a, a lot of his visceral hatred of, of, of totalitarianism d derives from that experience. When he left the army, he stole one of these reels of raw tape he literally took it out of the unit to take home with him and he vowed that he was going to show this tape to his children when they grew up and reached the age of 14. He was known on the set as teacher, they called him, because he was constantly trying to instruct his fellow actors about the affairs of the world, what was going on in Europe, uh, to such an extent, they thought he was a bit of a bore. His closest friend in the screen act, in the um, motion picture unit of the US Army where he worked, his closest friend was a communist called Bernard Vorhaus. And Vorhaus, as a very old man, told me later on that um, of all the people he knew in Hollywood, Ronald Reagan was the best informed and the most um, intensely political person he'd ever met. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As president of the Screen Actors Guild, it is my great privilege to After the war, the program, Reagan naturally the becomes president of the, of the Screen Actors Country Guild. Hospital. But I could truthfully say that I'm speaking to you from the heart of Hollywood, because this new hospital and all that it represents is the real heart of Hollywood, the big, generous, loyal heart of Hollywood that goes unmentioned all too often. At the time, Reagan signs petitions against French colonialism in Indochina and for Mao Zedong. He himself, like many young men in the late 1930s, flirted with the idea of joining the Communist Party. He was still regarded as so radically left-wing that the FBI in 1946 and 1947 were keeping tabs on him as a potential communist. But as often happens with true believers in liberal causes, when he was disillusioned in those same years, 47, 48, the disillusionment was extreme. 1947, some employees from the studios supported by the American Communist Party start a strike and try to take control of the Screen Actors Guild. As president of the union, Ronald Reagan receives threats one of which came directly to him in the form of a telephone call from some anonymous uh, communist who said, um, we're going to throw acid in your face to make sure that you never act again. At that moment, he began to pack a pistol and uh, guard himself against threats against his life. So that's really what began to change him. He realized that the world of communism was not nice. These were anarchistic, dangerous people. 
and he detested everything they stood for. Communism, the greatest hoax of the century, was perpetrated on the world to cover and mask nothing more nor less than a program of Russian aggression and expansion. We met it more recently called Nazism under Hitler. We're meeting it again now under the name of communism. We can prove to the world that here in Hollywood, we have been fighting against this particular infiltration for a long time. Reagan is in unison with America. Worried by the communist expansion across Europe, lots of Americans see communists everywhere at the time. Congress even launches a witch hunt. Many actors and directors are summoned and put on the hot seat. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Absolutely invade the Then you right. deny to, you, you refuse to answer that question. Is that correct? I have told you that I will All right. offer my belief. Stand opinion. away from the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights, which you are to really destroy. Stand away from the stand. It's in this civil war-like atmosphere that Reagan is summoned to testify for the prosecution. But in front of cameras, he will prove more nuanced. I will be frank with you that as a citizen, I would hesitate or I would not like to see any political party outlawed on the basis of its political ideology because we've spent 170 years in this country on the basis that democracy is strong enough to stand up and fight for itself against the inroads of any ideology, no matter how much we may disagree with it. However, if it is proven that this organization is the agent of a foreign power or is in any way not a legitimate political party, and I think the government is capable of doing that if the proof is there, then that is another matter. If Reagan thus avoids mingling with the sectarian excesses of McCarthyism, he secretly takes part in the constitution of blacklists and works as an informer for the FBI. The same FBI which suspects a young actress to belong to the Communist Party. Worried, the young actress asks Ronald Reagan, the president of her union, a certificate of good character. Her name is Nancy. She will become his wife. The only real uh, person he had that was a good friend was his wife. The people that have run into him, sometimes they don't understand about him, that he's, he doesn't take them out for a drink and give them a beer and they can relax. He doesn't want to, he, he doesn't do that. He's self-controlled. And um, it was Nancy that explained this and why we put it in, in the book. She said, you know, he just, that is the way he is. He's by himself. He's, per he's perfectly happy by himself. And uh, he has no close friends. That's true. Inspired by Hollywood films at the time, Reagan adopts a clear mindset. The good guys on the one hand, the bad guys on the other. Binary, but efficient. Hello. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. Nikita Khrushchev says, in this world today, there's a fierce struggle of two ideologies, the communist and the capitalist. And in this struggle, there can be no neutrals. Whether you like it or not, history is on our side. If, as the communists say over and over again, war is inevitable, then it is sheer folly for us not to make every conceivable political, economic, military, and psychological preparation to win. No one knows what the end of the story will be. That's up to you. During the 50s, this speech runs at full throttle. But everything changes in the beginning of the 60s, when Khrushchev, General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, is invited with great ceremony to the United States by President Eisenhower. After being on the verge of nuclear apocalypse, now is time for detente. Reagan, the warmonger and his resolute speeches now have a sulfurous reap. His acting career is declining. He leaves Hollywood and changes his lifestyle, waiting for the better days to come. 
I was just trying to get into the mood. I guess we all remember these things. Above all else, the Gershwin years were years of change. Our nation was stirring with new ideas, new wants, new needs. We were building a better way of life. One of the new things that came along was General Electric's famous monitor top refrigerator, remember? The electric washing machine took the gloom out of wash day. And the vacuum cleaner eased another chore. It's a time of uncertainty, and Reagan is also uh, probably less certain about his politics in this period of time than in any other. This man on the left is the one in 1964 who will bring him back into the game. Barry Goldwater, candidate to the presidential election. Goldwater embodies the most anti-communist right wing of the Republican Party. His campaign is shaking, he needs allies, so Reagan comes just at the right time. I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. I have been permitted to choose my own words and discuss my own ideas regarding the choice that we face in the next few weeks. I think the speech is extraordinarily important for Reagan on a number of levels. It introduces him to millions of Americans who didn't know him except as a movie actor. It catapults him from being a, a, a kind of specialist, specialty figure to a national figure. That all those watching it realized this is the coming man of American Republican politics. We cannot buy our security, our freedom from the threat of the bomb by committing an immorality so great as saying to a billion human beings now enslaved behind the Iron Curtain, give up your dreams of freedom because to save our own skins, we're willing to make a deal with your slave masters. Goldwater is defeated, but Reagan takes his place. Therefore, he becomes the new champion of the hardline right wing. And then the uh, tremendous favorable reaction to that speech caused uh, a group of leading uh, businessmen in, in uh, California to seek him out uh, to run for governor. He was afraid that people would think, if he gave a detailed speech, that this was just an actor speaking the lines written by somebody else. So what he would do was he would speak for a few minutes outlining his ideas and then take questions for an hour, any question the audience might want to throw at him. In California, actor Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Reagan arrived to cast their votes. He's the Republican nominee for governor. It's his first political contest. His landslide victory has national significance. If he wins in November, party leaders predict he may rival Nixon and Romney as a presidential candidate in 1968. Reagan wins the election and becomes governor of California. That you take this obligation freely, without mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that you will weld and faithfully. In this democratic stronghold, he's immediately faced with the other America, the America which demonstrates against the war in Vietnam on the campus of UC Berkeley. Reagan sends the National Guard against the students, and there's bloodshed. For the conservative America, he's the right man for the job. So the following year, he runs against Nixon, in the Republican Party presidential primaries. To offer something that the people of this country are crying out for. They are crying out for leadership. A leadership that will say to all the nations of the world, yes, we want peace, but we will maintain the strength to see that we have peace we will not accept it as a dispensation of some foreign country given to us. 
There were some who even felt that uh, that we couldn't uh, be successful against the communists, that there was no way of winning the, the Cold War, as it was known, and therefore we should get the best deal we could uh, in our negotiations with, with the Soviets. Uh, Ronald Reagan felt that that was the wrong way to go, but that the communists were, treating on, were cheating on the agreements, uh, and that uh, as a result of that, the Western world, the free world, was losing to communism. Some ways Reagan was right. For the Soviets, the idea of eventual triumph of communism was never abandoned. The idea was to spread the Soviet influence in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and eventually maybe in Europe and surround the United States. Reagan is right, but it's too early. So Nixon is elected. Nixon embodies this temporary choice that America is willing to negotiate with the Soviets. In private, Nixon calls Reagan a dangerous moron. Seven years later, same scenario, except for this time, it's Gerald Ford, who's running against Reagan in the Republican primary. The President of the United States can't play with words. When you vote Tuesday, remember, Governor Reagan couldn't start a war. President Reagan could. In 1960s America, Reagan's speech doesn't go down well. After the fall of Saigon, the Watergate scandal, the oil shock, Congress answers to the peaceful aspirations of America. It votes massive military budget cuts. Reagan is then isolated, but he doesn't lower his guard, quite the contrary. He's waiting for his time to come and prepares for it, as shown on this visit in a nuclear missile control room. When, when you get in there, it was like, it's like a movie. Huge two stereo walls, you know, and all kinds of going on. And, uh, all kinds of people sitting there and watching things and checking. Reagan asks a very simple question to the base commander. What would happen if one of those had been sent at this thing and just land out front? What we can do, we can tell you within eight to ten minutes, depending upon where you are, exactly when it will be landing, where it will be landing, and how powerful it is. And then you're dead. And on the way back that night in the uh, plane, he said, you know, that a president of the United States has got a terrible problem here. Because if the weapon strikes, uh, we'll retaliate. And we have it. We have an incredible bomb shelter. And uh, they will die, and we will have the good feeling of knowing that they died as well as us. He said, that's terrible. He said, there has to be a better way. And the only way you can do it, you've got to figure out some way to take them down. When, the, when, the, when they're coming in. The Soviets themselves will prove Reagan right. The Soviets who take advantage of America's weakness for many years to rearm themselves and move their pawns everywhere around the world. In Eastern Europe, they violate the treaties and settle the missiles which directly threaten the West. So inevitably, mentalities start to change. In Washington, Reagan's ideas start to get through. To Richard Allen, for example, one of the architects of Nixon's policy, who asks for a meeting with Reagan and who gets it. So we talked, and we talked about everything. But before you go, there's one thing I want to tell you. I said, yes, sir. He said, Begin with, some people say that I'm simplistic, uh, but there's a difference between being simplistic and having a simple answer to a complex problem. I said, yes, sir. And he said, so with that in mind, I'm going to tell you my theory of the Cold War. Yes, sir. He said, my theory of the Cold War is that we win and they lose. What do you think about that? I, I was 
caught off guard and I said, Governor, do you mean that? And he said, well, of course I mean it. I just said it. And my response was, well, sir, uh, I don't know if you're ever going to run for president of the United States again. Four years is a long time. But if you're going to run, I would very much like to be on your team. I never heard anyone say, win the Cold War. I heard Mr. Nixon many times talk about managing the Cold War. I saw a very sound structure, very sound structure, but with certain lacunae, certain gaps of information and certain missing pieces that needed to form a better structure, uh, ostensibly a perfect structure, but a better structure. To fill in those holes, I thought that was interesting. Allen decides to introduce Reagan to an informal group, the Committee on Present Danger, a group of intellectuals and experts on the Soviet Union, often estranged Democrats, sometimes former Trotskyists who became anti-communists. In short, neoconservatives before there was a name for it. Well, I had to persuade them to meet Reagan. They had a very um, low opinion, shall I say, because the, the general concept was that while he had been governor of California, that was irrelevant, that was Californians do crazy things. Anyway, uh, and they really didn't know much about him and uh, thought he was finished. He had lost to Ford, and after all, he was getting up in years, older and older. So this was a huge opportunity. This great intellectual resource was being wasted. Reagan needed to be refueled or fueled uh, on these matters. That's a perfect match. So we began to do our own analysis of the Soviet Union. And that was the bulk of the work I did. And I produced some memos about the Soviet Union that were very different from what the CIA was reporting. What, what the CIA didn't understand is this. The Soviet economy might be growing, but that's because they were increasing production of steel or men's shoes or coal. We were growing because we were producing computers and electronic equipment. Now, to an economist, 3% is 3%, but it's not the same thing. So we began to give... President Reagan, a very different picture of the Soviet Union. And I can remember the moment that the Reagan peering over his glasses and looking at me when this subject was being debated, and we talked about the economy, and he said, you know, I think we can, why can't we push on them until they fall over backwards? And the various economists in the room said, yes, that will work. And he looked at me and said, that's what we're going to do. Nineteen seventy nine. In the heat of the campaign, one event changes the situation. It confirms in a spectacular way the prophetic speeches given by the candidate. For the first time after the war, the Soviets invade a new territory. The Red Army enters Afghanistan. So America gets scared, and Reagan seems to be heaven sent. He soars in the polls. But Reagan, who knows the Soviet giant to be weaker than it seems, exaggerates. He takes advantage by over-dramatizing the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply concerned about our defense posture. The Soviet army is now twice the size of ours. The United States is no longer the first military power on Earth. I think looking back, he exaggerated the American weakness. Now also, it was a very useful electoral technique. There's no question. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Reagan is elected with a considerable differential to his opponent. At the White House, he presents his new team of tough guys. 65 members of Richard Allen's Committee on Present Danger are appointed at key posts while he keeps playing with his image of a dreary actor and a nice fellow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I look around. Oh, please. 
I want you to know that I don't expect every morning to be greeted by the Marine Band. <laughs> I've just come down from breakfast, but I'm happy to see you all here. I see a lot of faces of staff. At the Kremlin, however, the KGB is on alert. For 20 years, General Kalugin was the head of Soviet espionage in the United States. He had a ringside seat regarding Reagan's election. Well, I was one of those Russians uh, who viewed Reagan as a guy who was not fit to become a president of the United States. There was nothing good about Reagan. That this is a guy who is uncontrollable, reckless, adventure, uh, Hollywood type, I mean, uh, illiterate in many ways. And he was viewed by the Soviet propaganda and by the Soviet leadership as a guy who doesn't know what he's doing. And when we had people like Carter or other guys, that was more or less okay. But uh, you know, Reagan, a right-wing extremist, taking over, that meant for most Russian elite. That was really an extraordinary t you know, t tension and extraordinary fear. The only morality they recognize is what will further their cause, meaning they reserve unto themselves the right to commit any crime, to lie, to cheat, in order to attain that, and that is moral, not immoral. And we operate on a different set of standards. And with that, a collective gasp, <gasps> like, sort of like that. I could just feel it and hear it, and I could see the press turning to look at what Haig would say, or perhaps what I would say, as we stood on the side. And I could see that Haig was going, oh my God, as if it had been an, a colossal blunder on the part of Reagan. What does that signify? All along, he planned to say that. And he knew that if he would give that response to the staff, some would say, oh no, 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 don't, don't say that. Reagan knew precisely what he was doing. He said something that caused an uproar. Oh my God, the papers the next day in Europe, new tensions in the Cold War, uh, this was considered an error. No, Reagan was defining the challenge. To achieve his goal, Reagan provides for America's biggest military effort in peacetime. We had a session on the options to restore military strength. So I took to him a folder, more or less like a menu. And there was the MX, an improvement in command and control, and an inc new weapon systems, submarines, and so on. It's a building. This menu was quite extensive. And so he said, OK, well, he said, give me your pen. So I handed him my pen. and. Uh, opened the menu and he looked at it, closed the menu and handed it back to me and he said, uh, well, fellas, as you can see today, I have a very big appetite. And he had checked every box. Look at there. That was given me by a reverend who was persecuted for his religion today at this luncheon. And this was made in prison secretly. The, the prisoners made these little scriptures that they could pass around and so they could Mr. still Reagan. believe and have some symbol of their, of their belief. Soviet Union? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Soviet Union. Yeah. yeah. Gulag. Oh. Well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Nice Thank to you. see you all. Bye -bye. Now nothing can stop Reagan. Not even the ceremonial decor of the UN, which he uses as a court. Before Gromyko, the petrified foreign affairs minister to the Soviet Union, he doesn't hold back. We refuse to become weaker while potential adversaries remain committed to their imperialist adventures. And that's why we're so deeply concerned by Soviet conduct. Soviet-sponsored guerrillas and terrorists are at work in Central and South America, in Africa, 
the Middle East, in the Caribbean, and in Europe, violating human rights and unnerving the world with violence. My country learned a bitter lesson in this century. The scourge of tyranny cannot be stopped with words alone. So Reagan puts his words at the service of his actions. He signs a secret order which provides to contain and reverse the Soviet expansion by a confrontation everywhere across the world, and particularly by military means. The CIA then becomes the sinew of war. He met privately with the CIA director very often, and these meetings were not listed on calendars. These were unofficial meetings. So President Reagan was probably closer to the intelligence service than, than any other president that I'm aware of. In Afghanistan, the CIA organizes the distribution of the latest anti-aircraft weapons to mujahideens, a decision which comes as a terrible blow against the Red Army. The CIA also helps the Polish rebellion. It manipulates the old prices to ruin the USSR. It sabotages its technologies. Across the world, like in Nicaragua, it supports the anti-communist guerrillas. According to the Soviet Union, you can have a communist insurgency, but there's no such thing as an anti-communist insurgency. We were funding five. And part of my job was to pull together this intelligence so that the president could see that Soviet leaders were beginning to get very worried, even panic, because suddenly the rules of the game had changed. It's on the European theater that the decisive set of this chess game is being played. In Europe, where Reagan wants to deploy nuclear missiles to block the Soviets. A lot of people did not want to do this. In fact, the Secretary of State was furious about that. You can't do that. You can't stop. You mustn't do that. But you can't do it that way. You cannot do it that way. It would upset our allies in France and Germany. If you do that, they'll go to war. So you can't do that. When I traveled through Europe, what a lot of the European leaders said is, you guys are crazy. This is dangerous. Don't poke sticks at a wounded bear. That was the phrase they used, don't poke sticks at a wounded bear. And our feeling was, the bear's on his knees, it's a good time to break his head. So that was the fight, that's what the issue was about. Reagan gets over the oppositions. He orders the settlement of hundreds of Euro missiles pointed towards the Soviet Union. As a result, in June 1982, millions of people demonstrate in Central Park, New York City, and all across Europe against his policy and in support of peace. I'd rather be red than dead, is the slogan at he the He didn't time. care. I never saw Reagan care about anything. He was extraordinarily strong, almost cold man. Uh, he knew that he was controversial and deeply unpopular in those first two or three years of his presidency with a large segment of the American people. He knew he was mocked in many places around the world. He knew that world leaders like uh, Pierre Trudeau in Canada and Francois Mitterrand in France thought he was an idiot. It didn't bother him at all. 1983. This is when Reagan chooses to go to the border with East Berlin. Like a bullfighter holding his red cape before a bull. Then he announces to his advisors a project that he's been meditating since his visit to the nuclear control room five years earlier. A program that would destroy any airborne missile targeting America. For an American citizen, the idea may seem interesting. In fact, it's felt like a clap of thunder, and nobody is mistaken. So they listened, and they said, um, did we hear what we think we heard? And he said, yeah, you heard what we think, what you think you heard. Nobody agrees with him. But if you look at around, whether it's in the State Department, the Defense Department, and on and on, uh, about 
taking away the nuclear weapons. It's no, no, you don't do that. There's a reason for these reactions of panic. Until then, peace relied on what we called at the time the balance of terror. None of the two giants could trigger the nuclear weapon without risking to be wiped off the map by the other giant. Well, this forced peace might be shattered by Reagan's proposal. If one of the two giants gets a strategic advantage, then the nuclear war becomes possible again. A hypothesis which even scares the advisors of the president. In order to go around them, he decides to force his way through. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies? I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished before the end of this century. Yet current technology has attained a level of sophistication where it's reasonable for us to begin this effort. A research program of $50 billion is then launched. It plans to settle thousands of satellites in space which could destroy Russian rockets thanks to lasers. In the United States, the Missile Shield project is dubbed Star Wars. A giant bluff or a serious project? What is certain is that Reagan and his advisors know that Russians are forced to take up the challenge, and that's where they're expecting them. The Soviet economy was in shambles, but partially because we spent too much money, too much of our own, I mean, everything on for military purposes. With Reagan's uh, Star Wars program, the Soviets felt that we would, and that was a, a White House sort of plan to destroy the Soviet Union economically. That was the message, which was uh, well, I mean, uh, sort of accepted uh, in, in Moscow. They knew we had the money and they didn't. They were aware their economy was in trouble. They knew that we knew their economy was in trouble. And that's what changed the dynamics. And that's why the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, was the end. That was the bullet between the eyes. So they understood immediately what had happened. The intelligence that reached my desk the morning after President Reagan's Star Wars speech was different. You could see the next day that the Kremlin's leaders knew they were in trouble, that their military leaders knew that we had figured this out and there was no way they could beat us now. They couldn't compete. It was over. The USSR, which already devotes 40% of its budget to defense and must import wheat, is now incapable to follow the American military effort. But the bear is on his knees, and that's when he's the most dangerous. Well, you can show that it could have been dangerous, you know, because going step to step to a war, maybe. Oh, yes. Oh, very much so. Uh, the most dangerous time of all is when a nuclear superpower thinks it may cease to exist. In fact, I wrote a memo about that, uh, that we are now entering the most dangerous period of the Cold War when the Soviet Union thinks it may lose. And Reagan also was aware? Oh, he's very much aware of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he smiled and, and he knew how to make jokes, but everybody aw was aware that this was extraordinarily dangerous. But what Reagan didn't expect was that the Russians are on the verge of warfare. In November 1983, during an American drill dubbed Able Archer, the Soviets believe that the United States are attacking them. And they get ready to retaliate. Andropov, who said at some point, privately, we were uh, at that time closer to a nuclear mutual annihilation that at any time in, in, in the world's history, in Reagan's time. That's why Reagan was viewed, as I say, very dangerous guy, very dangerous and something, you know. 
And drop-off would come to the conclusion that we were looking for a first strike. And um, when Reagan found out about this, I think he was a little bit, you got to be kidding, but you know, what, why would that, why we want to do that? But then when it became serious, that it was serious, serious. And the information from him that they really were worried, yes, that impressed uh, Reagan. And he said, we must work harder to convince them that we're not going to attack them. You know, we're not suicidal, for heaven's sakes. And it didn't really cross Reagan's mind that they could be genuinely uh, worried about his intentions. I know he would ask, for example, Mitterrand uh, directly, can they really be afraid of us? He would ask Cole, he would ask Thatcher. Uh, and they would say, you know, they seem to be. He had decided before Abel Archer that he had to develop a tie with the Soviet uh, leaders so that he could demonstrate to them that he was not the sort of person who would dev de devour his children. He said, George, the situation is dangerous. There's no human contact. And so I saw it, and Reagan sought to rebuild that human contact. Five, four, three, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, and I'm attempting to speak directly to the people of the Soviet Union. In these times of stress, I believe that the people of the world must know and understand how each other feel. The American people want less confrontation and more communication and cooperation. America's recovery may have taken Soviet leaders by surprise. If the Soviet government wants peace, then there will be peace. Together, we can strengthen peace, reduce the level of arms. Let us begin. Now. Thank you. Again, I believe that we're getting the evidence of willingness from the Soviet Union to at least negotiate, to talk, because we are going forward with the rebuilding of our own military. The Soviet Union uh, also has some very real problems. And maybe someone should point out to them that uh, the road to peace and uh, a giving up of that aggressive intent uh, might be helpful to them with their own uh, economic problems. These tactics will prove right. Soon after, Reagan receives a Soviet minister at the White House for the first time, Andrei Gromyko, the very man he used to criticize violently a few months ago at the UN. This time, the USSR is asking to negotiate. Reagan is the game master. The Soviet Union is trapped. If it was a trap, it was designed to get the Soviets to fall into the peaceful trap and end the Cold War peacefully. Remember, you're dealing with a nuclear superpower. It's very dangerous. You, you want to end it, but not with a bang. And that was part of what Reagan understood. End it, but end it gently. The negotiations calm down the Kremlin. The game comes to an end for Reagan, who can now reap the effects of his policy. To equal the American military, the heads of the Kremlin have finally understood that they had to reform their economy. At the Politburo, they put forward an ambitious leader called Michael Gorbachev. The rot has set in. The Soviet regime is doomed. Reagan has been in power for three years. He has definitely won the Cold War. Nineteen eighty-eight. Reagan is in Moscow. Gorbachev is leading the perestroika. 
A tired USSR cannot sustain these reforms. The empire of Lenin and Stalin has only three years left to live. I had no idea that in my lifetime I would see the collapse of the Soviet system. Never. I shouldn't say never. I did not have that expectation. And certainly Reagan didn't either. I believe that Reagan's policies accelerated the Russian decline and eventual downfall of the USSR. That's my strong belief. Reagan's policies pushed uh, the process of dissolution of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Before he met Gorbachev, he sat down and, as he often did, wrote out his ideas on uh, uh, a yellow legal pad, several pages. The point he made in those was, whatever we achieve, we must not call it victory, this morning we have because that will make the next achievement more difficult. The victory of the anti-communist orator will therefore remain confidential. But it doesn't bother Reagan, the secretive man this, who likes to hide himself behind his old actor's music image. Here. To see all of you, I was just thinking, if I'd drawn this big a crowd in Hollywood, I'd still be there. <laughs> what you've accomplished is no small achievement even under the best of circumstances.